our gracious Heavenly Father. We come to you this morning with mixed emotions. Excited to be in your house. Excited to be able to worship with the church body. But also with some concerns. Some heavy hearts about what is going on in our country at this time. And Father, we know you have a plan and purpose in place. And we ask that you would heal our land. That you would cause the senseless dyings to cease. That you would cause the senseless riots to cease. But Father, what we need to do as Christians is to give people the gospel. Nothing is ever going to change unless it's a heart change. And Father, the only person that you can do that is you. And you're the only one who can change people's hearts. And Father, at this time, we ask that you would change people's hearts. You would draw people unto yourself. Uh, Father, that we would see a revival in the land. That you would heal our land. And that uh, we would be honoring and praising you this morning. Father, help us as your body this morning as we go into the services. Help us as we try now to take the outside thoughts of this world, the cares, the concerns, the different circumstances that we may be facing, our own personal trials and tribulations, Father, and set them aside for a time. And let us concentrate on you and you alone, for you are worthy to be praised. We ask these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So, as if for those of you who've been watching Facebook Live, we have been doing the Heidelberg at the beginning to try to help us as we go through um, this time. Uh, if you recall, the first son, the last Sunday before we were able to meet all together again, uh, we introduced the Heidelberg as something that was written during the time of the bubonic plague, and it was able as a teaching tool to help these individuals go through it. And so, we are on uh, Lord's Day. Number 12, the question and answer will be on the screen. On the screen. Uh, so Lord's Day number 12, why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? The answer, because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who fully reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our deliverance, our only high priest who has delivered us by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually intercedes for us before the Father and our eternal King, who governs us by his word and spirit, and who guards us and keeps us in the deliverance he has won for us. Question 32. But why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a free conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for eternity. Some good thoughts for us to think about today as we go about our day. Uh, let us stand and sing, crown him with many crowns. Crown him with many crowns. And if you can, please wear a mask. If you understand, if you cannot, we understand as well.
Psalm 65, because that is where we are heading uh, this evening in the sermon. So would you mind playing through that uh, Psalm 65C for us, Ms. Carolyn? Understand the two.
if you would take your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 19 for our Old Testament reading this morning. Exodus chapter 19. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6. We will do this responsibly. I'll do the first verse, you do the second verse, I'll do the third verse, and so forth and so on. We will stand out of respect of God's word this morning. Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. If you do not have the Bible, the words will be on the screen. Exodus chapter 19, verse number 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they into the wilderness of Sinai. For they and Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bare you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. These are the words which thou speak unto the children of Israel. May the Lord add a blessing to his word being read this morning. Thank you, and you may be seated. We would normally at this time have the ushers come forward, because I almost said it. Um, but hopefully you saw there is a box out there in the foyer for those of you who want to give. Uh, the, so, so we don't have a lot of interaction with one, each other. Just put your offering, your tithes in that box, and we greatly appreciate it. And on another note, I really do uh, commend you all for how you have been giving through this time. I know it has been difficult. Um, it has been not been easy, and for you all to continue to give to the church, I'm sure the Lord has been both uh, thankful, and uh, I'm sure you were blessed as much as I have been blessed for how you have all been continuing to give, even in the midst of us not being together. So thank you from my heart, and thank you from the church as well. So let us sing, I will sing of my Redeemer, I will sing of my Redeemer.
turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 5 this morning. Romans chapter 5 for our New Testament reading. We will stand again for the reading of God's Word. We'll read verses 1 through 12. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We will do it this time in unison. We'll do it this time in unison. Romans 5, 1 through 12. Again, the words will be on the screen. Verse number 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man someone even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Thank you. You may be seated. May the Lord add a blessing to his word being read this morning. Let us sing, Come, ye thankful people, come. Come, ye thankful people, come.
ladies for playing. Thank you for your singing at this time. Children may be dismissed to Children's Church. As they are dismissed, if you would take your Bible, turn to Psalm 65 this morning. Psalm 65. Maybe we should take more breaks because that's the quietest they've gone to children's church in quite some time. <laughs> Many of you know we try to do uh, the scripture reading and the hymns based around uh, what is said in scripture for the message to help try to um, uh, reinforce the idea of what we're preaching about. And so hopefully you've kind of got some of the songs in your head, some of what the songs were saying to help us as we go into Psalm 65. Uh, it has actually been a wonderful blessing, and I've said this uh, repeatedly, going through the Psalms during this time. Uh, we got a few more weeks of this, and we, have fin we will have finished book two of the Psalms, uh, finishing there in Psalm 72. And the plan is to get back into Matthew, but I think it has been... Uh, a wonderful thing to be able to go through the Psalms during this time if you've been keeping up with the videos uh, at home. Uh, this particular Psalm, Psalm 65, if I can bring up my notes, is a, an extraordinary Psalm. Not preached on a lot. Uh, if you were to do a quick Google search of Psalm 65, you're not going to see a lot of psalm uh, sermons preached from this. And I, I don't know why. Uh, this is a, a, a magnificent, an extraordinary, beautiful psalm. Uh, and Boyce says it is predominantly about the God of nature, who is gracious to man, powerful in his acts, and the source of all nature's bounty. And he goes on to say, which is what we would expect of a song written by David. Before we read in this psalm, let us go to the Lord in prayer, uh, put our minds and hearts underneath the teaching of Scripture, and uh, we will move forward into the sermon entitled, The Bountiful God, The Bountiful God. Let us pray. Now, Father, we thank you again for this wonderful day outside. Father, we thank you again for allowing us to meet together as your people in your building. Father, we have missed it, we have longed for it, and finally you have answered our prayers to allow us to be together again. Father, as we look into this passage this morning, and we think about this passage and we meditate on this passage, would you show yourself in your word? Would you allow us to gain a greater appreciation of who you are this morning? Father, that you would remind us that you are our Redeemer, that you would remind us that you are our Creator, and that you would remind us that you are our Sustainer. Father, we thank you for how you have sustained us over the last few months. We thank you for teaching us to long to be with your people once again. And these things we ask in your Son's precious and holy name. Amen. Psalm 65, to the chief musician, a psalm and song of David. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O thou that hearest prayer unto thee, shall all flesh come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God, of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are far off upon the sea, which by his strength setteth fast the mountains, being girded with power, which stilleth, stilleth the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves, and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens, Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. 
Thou preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. This psalm or song or prayer, depending on how you look at it, is a song about the bountiful God. It's about the bounty of God. It's about God's bounty. It's about how he is bounteous and giving blessings to his people. And if you, uh, we have sang the harvest and come, ye thankful people come, uh, I, I would think the psalmist does a much better job than that hymn. And one of the reasons we sang that hymn is to help us be thankful for what God has done for us. And it would seem that one of the reasons for writing this psalm, or what we would call the occasion, is the uh, many of the many harvest festivals prescribed for the Israelites uh, dealing with, that included Passover, that it dealt with Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, though we're not necessarily for sure what the exact occasion for this, this is considered a harvest or a hymn of thanksgiving, uh, the opening verses leads us uh, credence to what we have just mentioned and even offer us uh, something that we should celebrate God's past and present goodness with the anticipation of God's going to bless us again in the future. And so such a theme that God wants to bless his people should encourage us as his people during uh, this time, especially in a very broken world, would it not that we need the encouragement that God wants to bless his people? And it's been said of many commentators that of all the Psalms, uh, this one excels in its beautiful description of God's care for his creation. And so as we study these 13 verses this morning, uh, may we learn to worship God because of his grace and his care and sustaining of his creation and us during this time. The three things I want us to look at this morning as we go through this Psalm 65 is I want to see the praise of God of grace. I want us to see that uh, uh, we are going to see the God of might. God is sovereign and that God is our provider. And if you noticed, if you remember to my prayer, you can even say in three words, redeemer, creator, and sustainer. This morning. So, as we deal with uh, who God is, let us look at praising God for his grace to us. We see in this psalm, in the first stanza, verses 1 through 4, uh, we see people sitting, waiting for God in Zion. Uh, we think that there's been some sort of punishment, God's punishment on Israel. There's been a drought in years past. There's been famine. God has withheld the rain. And the people of God are now in the temple courts because the drought has been broken and the harvest is coming in. Now, these people are rejoicing because they no longer are in famine and drought, but God has blessed them with a bountiful harvest. He has answered their request for forgiveness. He showed them mercy in providing for them rain and food for a harvest once again. God, these people are delighting in God as the one who has redeemed them by forgiving their sins. They, he is the creator of the whole earth. He is the provider, and he's the one who's provided bounteously. And so we begin as these throngs of worshipers have come into the temple, and they're praising God. But the interesting thing is, is we don't see it in the translation here. Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. They're praising God, but they're not saying anything. They are sitting in silence. If you were to look at other translations, that would be provided for you, but these people are praising God by sitting in silence. They are stunned by God's mercy. 
They are in awe of what God has done to the point that it has completely shut their mouth. Their hearts are so overflowing with praise to God that they can't even get it past their throats because it's almost as if they're getting ready to cry. They are stunned by God's mercy and His grace. Now, have we been at that point where we have seen God work in our lives to the point that we want to praise God, but we cannot because we are stunned by what God has done for us? God has done such marvelful things for us in our lives that sometimes it is so grand, so glorious that we just sit stunned in silence because of what God has done. I mean, we don't understand famine and drought like they've experienced. Maybe it's a year, maybe it's two, maybe it's three. But to finally get rain for their crops, to finally get sustenance in their stomachs, to finally able to see that God has blessed them, and to finally see the bountiful harvest that God has given them, uh, to be able to sit in the temple and worship God, and then to sit in stunned silence because of God's mercy. They can't even find the words to say because of how good God has been to them. They've seen the famine. They've seen God's judgment. And they've seen God's blessing. And they sit in silence because that's all they can do because God has graced them so much. This paints a a beautiful picture for us as we gather together again into God's house. To be able to see God's presence here in his house. We should be thankful that God has allowed us to be able to meet again. And this is what we should be doing every Lord's Day. Should it not be thankful that we are to be able to meet with him? And it's sad that it's been taken two months away from us to be able to meet, to be able to finally realize how glorious a thing that we have and the ability to be able to meet as God's people in God's house on the Lord's Day. This is what we should be doing every Lord's Day, honoring God, praising Him for what His grace has bestowed upon us in our lives. Now, we should be gathering as and with the temple, right? Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. We should include in our thanksgiving a performance of vows, as he says there in the end of verse 1, a form of praise, expressions of thanksgiving, the exercise of gifts, gifts in the service of the temple. And somewhere along the way, as they are sitting in praise, they remember that they have sinned. They've sinned egregiously. And God has forgiven them. They have, may have said, Lord, we recognize our sins and we repent. They are basically saying, Lord, you are our only hope. We cannot bring the rain. We cannot bring the sunshine. We cannot bring the bountiful crops. We cannot grow the crops. Lord, all we do is we work and we till the ground and we do these things, but it is by your hand that you provide. We are resting in you, God. We are trusting in you. You are our only hope. And Father, when you bring that answer, and when you bless us with these good crops, we will be in your house, and we will praise your name, and we will extol your goodness. This is an expression of the confidence they had in God, and what God would do for them as they hear their prayers, and they are exceedingly grateful to God and how he's answered their prayers. And he says there, uh, O thou hearest prayer unto thee, shall all flesh come, and iniquities prevail against thee. Verse 3, as for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach thee, that he may dwell in the courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. 
And it's interesting because there at the end of verse 2, he says, all flesh come. Uh, we're dealing with the temple. The Gentiles weren't allowed to enter into the tabernacle. The Gentiles weren't allowed to enter but the outer courts of the temple during Herod's time. And David says, all flesh come. David is almost as if he is prophesying that there is going to be a time when all flesh will be able to gather together and praise the Lord. Remember in John chapter 2, verses 19, 19 through 22, Jesus says of himself, Jesus answered and said unto them, What? Destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. John says, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. As great as this bountiful harvest is, as great as uh, these people are stunned in silence and in awe about what God is doing for them in their lives, what is even greater blessing is how God has reached down into a spiritual harvest. That was promised by and in Christ. And as we look at these four verses that tell us five things about God, as we look at God the Redeemer, or we're praising God for His gracious acts towards us, we see that God is, He deserves praise. I mean, does He not deserve praise in your life for what He's done for you? You have been a sinner. You were at enemies with God. You were dead in trespasses of sin, as Paul says in Ephesians 2. And at some point, whether back then, whether now, whether in the future, God has lifted you up, caused you to see spiritually, causing you to be awakened so that he can call you at one of his child. He deserves our praise. He deserves our praise not only for what he's done in his salvation, but in this specific instance that he hears our prayers. I mean, we can come into the presence of the King of Kings, the creator of this universe, and pray to him, and he answers our prayer. Do we fathom the magnificence of that thought? That we can go into the presence of God and talk with Him. Whenever we want. We don't have to make an appointment. We don't have to take a number. Whenever we want, we can come into God's presence and pray and talk with Him. So He deserves praise. He hears our prayer. He forgives sins. Verse 3, Iniquities prevail against me, as for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. I mean, think about it. He deserves praise because of his bountiful harvest he's given the nation of Israel in verse 1. He hears their prayers and answers them by giving this bountiful praise, and then they recall his redeeming acts by being gracious enough to forgive them of their sins. And sometimes we have a hard enough time forgiving one another because of the acts that we do towards one another. And yet God has redeemed us and has forgiven us of our sins. And should then that cause us to praise him? But it doesn't stop there. Verse 4, blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest us to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. And this is very interesting. If you think about it, in the Old Testament times, the only people allowed into the tabernacle were who? The Levites, right? A group of 12 tribes, only the Levites were allowed into the temple or the tabernacle. What's even more impressive is the fact that it was only male Levites allowed. So we can say one twenty-fourth of the population was allowed to come into the temple or into the tabernacle to worship God. It was only by God's grace that you were a Levite. 
It was only by God's grace that you were a male that was allowed to enter into the tabernacle. They were chosen by God to fulfill this specific service. But again, Israel was alone in being able to worship this God. They were the ones who were called as nations from among other nations. Exodus chapter 19, in which we read, right? When we read that he called the nation of Israel and he bore them on eagles' wings. And they, God has called these individuals into a relationship with the living God to praise him in the temple. But one of the glorious things about the New Testament is it's no longer one twenty-fourth of the population. God calls everyone into worship. Levite, non-Levite, male, female. He has invited all that has come into his presence to worship and praise him. And there is one reason why they were empowered to be able to worship and praise God the Father. Because their iniquities were forgiven. Again, verse 3, iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest us to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy temple. They had good reason to believe that God would accept their vows because God had forgiven them. And the only reason they were forgiven was because God's grace. The only reason you're allowed to worship God today, this morning, is because God's grace has been poured out on your life. And that should cause us to praise him because we're no different than the person across the street. We're no different than our next door neighbor. We're no different than the people that we work with. Why is it, what is it about you that caused God to pour out his grace on you? Nothing. Nothing. For some unknown reason, God poured his grace out on you. As these worships were were gathered into the temple or into the tabernacle, they would be made aware of their guilt. Again, why would we come into a place to worship if we don't recognize our sinfulness? We are terrible, sinful creatures. And I'm not excluding myself from this. I am a terrible, sinful creature myself. Why would God allow me to come into his house to worship him. Even in forgiving me every day. Sometimes I seem like I sin every moment of every day. And he has allowed me now to come into his house to be a fellowship with his believers and worship him. As one commentator writes, if praise is not to be offered superficially, if we're not to offer praise superficially, he says, a man must reckon, man or woman, must reckon with his sins. The inclusion of atonement in this passage of scripture, the idea of covering, purging them away, is a significant. For David, it was, a, it was a sacrifice of an animal, a picture of Christ's covering of blood at the cross. For us, it is Christ. For us, it is Christ covering our sins by his blood on the cross. Our gratitude for God is rooted in the fact that he has covered our sins. He has atoned for our sins. 
That's why Paul can write in 1 Thessalonians, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. We can't give thanks unless we realize that God sent his son to die for our sins. That he's forgiven our sins. That's why we come to church to worship. That's why we praise him day in and day out. Because of all that is said and done, we stand before God not as enemies, but as children adopted into his family. And so when we express gratitude for God, for what God has done, we do it standing on the basis that God has forgiven us. This God chose us to worship Him. Not because you have done anything, rather in spite of what you have done. And then finally in verse 5, he says, By terrible things and righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God, of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are far off upon the sea. We will be satisfied, he says, by the goodness of God. Verse 4. You see this God that uh, deserves our praise, this God who forgives our sins, this God who answers prayer, is also this same God that is good. He blesses us. The answer prayer evokes praise to those who have received answers. The, the point is of verses 1 through 4 is that we realize that the only reason we are able to worship God is because of his free grace. And it is a privilege, it is a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Do we, do we realize the privilege that we have to worship him in the house of the Lord? Do, do we realize that the Lord has given us the ability to worship him? I mean, this question may have been differently answered two months ago when we were going about the normal Sunday's here, we're going to church. Sunday's here, I don't know if I'm going to go to church. But now that we've been without church for two months, let us never take for granted the privilege that we have to come into this house and worship God. Amen. Because I think the failure to appreciate what God has done in our lives causes us to become apathetic to meeting in God's house. Because those of us who've been raised by the gospel of Jesus Christ in our own lives should be grateful for the fact that we are able to come to God's house. And if you are not grateful to come to the Lord's house on the Lord's day, You might want to ask God for grace and mercy in your own life. In verses 5 through 8, quickly we see God as the creator. God is sovereign. By terrible things and righteousness without answer, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are far off upon the sea. Not only do we praise God for his grace, we can we praise God for his answered prayer, verses 1 through 4. We praise God that he is the God, the creator of God. We see here in these four verses, 5, 6, 7, and 8, that God is the sole ruler of this world. 
He alone is in control of this world. We like to be in control of our own sphere of influence. We like to be in control of our circumstances, but in fact, it's God who's in control. He's the only one who can answer, answer people's cry for deliverance. He's the only one who can answer them with awesome deeds and uh, righteousness. He is the trust or confidence of all the ends of the earth. I mean, think about it. His trust, his sovereignty is to the ends of the earth. And not just Hudson, Maine, not just Maine, not U.S., but the entire world, God is sovereign over. Every nook and cranny and corner of the world, God is in complete control. His stretches from sea to sea, from coast to coast, from shore to shore. And he is reminding us that God is our only hope in this world. Verses 7 and 8, which stilleth the noise of the sea, the noise of their waves and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. The, the psalmist is using these beautiful word pictures to help us understand how God is in complete control. These word pictures are using, God's using these Pictures of creation help us understand that there are pagan nations against God that want their control and they want to rip it from God. But nevertheless, he, we are told that he is able to control all of these things, even very nature himself, itself. I mean, think about what Jesus did on the on the uh, the Sea of Galilee, Mark chapter four, verse thirty nine. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? We come in contact every day with the awesomeness of God and how he intercedes on our behalf. Do we pay attention to it? Do we recognize it? Do we understand what God's doing on our behalf? Verses 9 through 13, he is the praise of the bountiful God. He is the sustainer. Thou visitest the earth and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which is full of water. There preparest them corn when thou hast so provided for it. Thou waterest the ridges thereof abundantly. Thou settlest the furrows thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. They drop upon the pastures of the wilderness, and the little hills rejoice on every side. The pastures are clothed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. The amazing thing about this God in Psalm 65 is he redeems us, he creates us, and he sustains us. He is a gift-giving God of plenty. The psalmist David is giving us a, a picture of the hills there in Israel, how uh, they're planted with corn, they're planted with crops. And he is giving thanks for how God graciously sustains those crops. One of the hymns that sometimes is sung around Thanksgiving time is, We plow the fields and scatter. The first line, the first stanza is, We plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. 
but it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. He sends the snow in winter, the warmth to swell the grain, the breezes and the sunshine and soft, refreshing rain. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord. We'll thank the Lord for all his love. You see what the, the psalmist is doing, the hymn writer is doing is, we go out, we do the work. We till the ground. We do the plowing. We remove the rocks. We plant. We tend to the garden. We tend to the fields. We tend to the farming. But can we send the rain? Can we bring the sunshine? Can we bring the proper temperatures? For it is God who sends the rain, it is God who sends the sunshine, it is God who sends the proper temperatures. The psalmist is celebrating, David is celebrating what God is doing for them at this time. That's why we say, come ye thankful people, come. Remember the first stanza of that hymn. Come ye thankful people, come. Raise the song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in, ere the winter storms begin. What's the next few words? God, our maker, does provide for our wants to be supplied. Come to God's own temple. Come. Raise the song of harvest home. We go from worship in verse 1, that sense of silence. I cannot utter, I cannot even magnify what God has done in my life and has blessed my life. And then verse 13 wraps it up with worship. And this time it is unrestrained worship. The pastures are closed with flocks. The valleys also are covered over with corn. They shout for joy. They also sing. Quite the contrast from verse 1 where they sit silently in praise to God because they are in awe of what God has done. They have rehearsed all of these things, what God has done for them, and at the end, they are finally able to sing and rejoice and worship God. And the picture is, is not just David is praising God, not just the Israelites, but all of creation is worshiping God in verse 13, whether it's the sheep or the cattle whether it's the shepherds or the herdsmen, all of creation is worshiping God for how God sustains them, for the creator God who he is, for God redeeming them. So let us be a pray, people of praise this morning. We live an unparalleled bounty in the U.S. We take for granted the opportunity to have that we have just to go to the store and stand in the line and pick groceries up. We're two or three generations removed from the fact of dealing with famine and hunger and starvation. But that doesn't mean that the Lord does not provide those things for us. That does not mean that we should not be thankful for where we are in our situation and in our society. And it should not cause us to be greedy and stingy with those things the Lord has provided for us. Because when we recognize that everything we have, and I mean everything, from the clothes on your back, to the vehicle out in the parking lot, to the house you live in, to the job that you have, everything comes from God. And when we realize that we have more than just about every other human being in the history of the world, we should not be greedy, we should not be stingy, but we should be a generous, grateful people for what the Lord has given us. Because when we realize that it is from God, 
we realize we don't deserve much. We realize in our own heart of hearts that we don't deserve the things that we have because God has blessed us with those things. So we have here before us this beautiful, magnificent Psalm 65. We praise God for his redemption. We praise God for his creation. And we praise God for his sustaining. May God grant us to join in with the psalmist this morning and praise him with joy over what God has done in our lives today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your psalm this morning. Father, forgive us if we have not been as grateful as we should have been. Father, forgive us for not recognizing what you are doing in our lives. Father, forgive us for taking the opportunity to worship for granted in your house with your people. For it is a privilege to be able to do this. Father, help us this morning. Through these things we ask in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Let us stand and sing our final hymn this evening, this morning, day by day, day by day. Savior and you're in good standing with a church, you're more than welcome to stay and partake it with us. Um, 
if you cannot, for some whatever reason, we understand. Uh, but uh, we look forward to seeing you this evening if you can come back. Also, I need to know as well if you plan on coming back next week so we can make sure our numbers are within the guidelines. So let me know as well if you're planning on being with us next week. And what a joy it has been to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. We thank you for being here with us again. Thank you for partaking with us on this Lord's Day. We thank our visitors as well. And we look forward to being back this evening as we celebrate this Lord's Day once again. Rich, would you close us in prayer? Now we'll give you a few minutes to stretch your legs and then we'll meet back here and we'll...